Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2019 Harmony webinar series. My name is Christy Weeks, and I'm the Business Development Coordinator for Harmony Foundation. Today's presentation will be facilitated by Christy Place on silent screaming, self-injury, and the journey to healing. For those of you who are new to Harmony, um, we are nestled on a 43-acre campus up in the Rocky Mountains, just outside of Estes Park, Colorado. Our Colorado Residential Rehab offers comprehensive treatment for adults and their family members. Who is Harmony Foundation? Our why factor, we believe that long-term recovery from alcohol and other drugs is possible. How we do it. As a place between two worlds, our location in the Rockies provides a safe and quiet respite from the pain of addiction. With 50 years of treating addiction, we have fostered a generation of long-term recovery who supports our clients and families for a lifetime. Harmony staff at all levels of the organization work together to create a community of recovery support that is long-lasting. We are a 70-bed residential program uh, located, as I said, at the base of the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. We offer an evidence-based 12-step program that is gender responsive. To learn more about Harmony Foundation, we invite you to visit us at www.harmonyfoundationinc.com or contact our admission staff at 866-686-7867. Just a few housekeeping rules or items to keep in mind as we roll along. You will be receiving an email within an hour after the presentation today, so please be sure to complete the online evaluation. You must be actively engaged in the presentation for at least 45 minutes in order to receive a certificate. We use a system that tracks how long people are engaged in the program, so anything less than 45 minutes would not qualify for a certificate through NADAC for CEUs. However, we can provide an attendance certificate if you need to jump off early. We also have a recorded version um, at the end, so if you wish to receive that, you'll just let me know and you can email me and I'll send it to you. Um, I would, let's see, you will also be receiving your certificate um, no later than Friday. If by chance you do not receive that certificate, please, please, please email me, cweeks at harmonyfoundationinc.com. So I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to our presenter, uh, Christy Place. I'm so excited she's here. She's with Door of the Soul. Christy has been working with adolescents adults and families in the field of psychotherapy for 14 years. She specializes in substance use, addiction, complex trauma resolution, spiritual exploration, and interpersonal wounds connected with attachment. She received her master's degree in professional mental health counseling. She holds a certification, a certification in child trauma from the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress and is a master addiction counselor. Christy utilizes a variety of therapeutic modalities, somatic attachment, dynamic repattering, guided imagery, sensory integration, therapeutic art exploration, resilience model, the polyvagal theory, and developmental psychopathology. Christy enjoys traveling around the country providing direct care, staff, and professional clinical trainings on a variety of topics, incorporating ex exper experiential excuse me, learning for some attendees. Yeah. Some topics include trauma-informed care, attachment theory, shame and resilience, and working with transgender and gender non-binary clients and their families. Um, <clears throat> At the end of this, um, we will be answering questions. So I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until the end. Um, there will be a chat box on the right hand side that we would like you to type your questions into. I'll field them for her and we'll address them all. Um, and so at this time, I would like to turn everything over to Christy. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. I know that's um, quite quite a mouthful. Um, it can be. Let me hit this button. 
um, can be quite a mouthful. And again, I appreciate <clears throat> the introduction. Again, my name is Christy Place. Um, I'm located just a little north of Atlanta um, here in Georgia, and I'm currently in private practice, and I'm just so glad to be with, with each of you um, today, and I appreciate all the work that everyone's doing out there. Um, so let's, um, let's, let's jump in it. Um, I will let you know, um, I typically do in-person trainings, so if my energy shifts or changes a little, I'm used to seeing lots of faces, so I'm just going to imagine a lot of faces right now. Um, but the topic of, of silent screaming, which again, I think I've heard so many clients reference in regard to self-injury, um, and what does it mean to self-harm, and where does that come from? Um, and why do some people struggle with it and some people don't at all? Um, and how do we help support people on that path? Um, so, so let's kind of jump in. Again, I, I will I do want to reference that I will absolutely make sure I have time for, to answer any questions at the end. I also want to be respectful of time and, and want to end on time as promptly as possible. Um, and again, feel free to just tap in any questions. And the other Christy that was just speaking, she'll help field those towards the end. So let's talk about self-harm. And again, some of the newer research over the past few years has really started to identify self-harm um, of a different kind of vernacular, which is non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so that's more of a term that I tend to use um, with clients as well as with their families. Um, because, you know, again, there's, there's so many mis misconceptions um, with lots of people. Um, not just clinically, but medically, and certainly out there in the world, that oftentimes um, people who are struggling with self-harm must be trying to kill themselves. And, and we know that that's just not necessarily the case if it's just coming from a place of self-harm. So I like, there's lots of different definitions out there about what self-harm is, and I like the Mayo Clinic's definition of several years ago, which is that self-harm can also be called self-injury or self-mutilation. And it's an act of deliberately causing harm to oneself, either by causing physical injury, um, putting oneself in dangerous situations, and or self-neglect. Um, I do want to touch base. I can hear a little noise in the background, so I'm not sure how that's coming in. Um, but just want to just want to get somebody to touch into that. Awesome. Um, so again, I think with a lot of self-harm behavior. Um, with the non-suicidal self-injury, oftentimes we can hear people say, um, I'm really not okay, and I can present that I'm not okay. And so just because I'm not crying doesn't mean I'm okay. And, and we certainly hear this a lot in our offices or out in our communities. Um, how do we get to know that? Um, and so I think that's really important. I think sometimes we tend to look for certain symptoms and traits of people if they're not okay. And some of our clients can actually do pretty well out in the world presenting that they are okay because they've had to, um, whether it's out of survival um, in a myriad of ways. So I want to take some time to talk about, I think it's important when we're talking about this, to talk about the form of self-injury. Um, and again, the forms of non-suicidal self-injury. And, and I know some of these are going to be pretty specific. Um, so please note that you just take care of yourself if you need to, if any of these words might be triggering for some people. Um, so again, I think the most common form that we tend to hear about, certainly in our, in our media, um, especially, and, um, is kind of the cutting or, um, carving into the skin. And that can be with words. People can carve in sometimes words, symbols, simple lines, um, <clears throat> and oftentimes, unfortunately, we can use kind of this really kind of crude language of, oh, they're a cutter. Um, and I, I always want to caution people around that, just the same that we probably work really hard to not say, um, oh, my gosh, they're so bipolar, or I've got a bipolar coming in my office. Um, that actually it's a person who struggles with bipolar disorder, right? So, so, for example, this would be maybe not a cutter. But this is a person who struggles with non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so that's language that I like to encourage for other clinicians, other direct care staff, as well as families. Um, another form would be certainly burning of the skin, um, the biting. I've certainly had clients who bite themselves. Some of that's out of tension, frustration, um, 
which a lot of our folks go through, picking or scratching, um, which can sometimes correlate to, um, depending on your clients, if, you're, if you work with people who have addiction, um, it's important to kind of evaluate or assess is the picking and scratching um, a trace that's coming from maybe a drug-related um, side effect? Um, sometimes we see that often with opioids, especially with meth as well. Um, or is this really a non-suicidal piece, or is this around some OCD pieces? Um, breaking bones. I've certainly worked with clients um, who broke, broke bones in terms of a self-injurious state, and um, some of these clients are actually people who work in the medical industry, who not only know how to break bones sometimes just right, but they also know how to reset them. Um, and some of you have may, may have worked with people in healthcare who not only cause self-harm to themselves, but know how to treat it um, as well. Persistent picking in a wound, again, to prevent healing. We certainly hear about that. Self-poisoning or swallowing, um, which can also happen. I have have worked with um, someone in the past who purposely swallowed shampoo when she took showers um, several times a week. And, and that was a process of where that comes from and what that's about. Um, piercing parts of the body with sharper objects. Um, again, not as a form of just, hey, it's some middle school girls who are trying to pierce their ears in a different place or pierce their nose. But is it, what's the message and what's the, what's the piece that they're trying to receive some relief around? Um, I think we could spend lots and lots of time around disordered eating, um, which, which we won't do today, and there are lots of other media and, and pieces and research and education out there, um, but there can also be some, some self-interest things around disordered eating, um, and sometimes we can see that in people who, I've worked with people who are diabetic, and they will not eat um, at times or eat certain things knowing how it's going to impact their insulin levels, for example, and their blood sugar. That's just one of, of numerous examples. And then we've also got people who maybe struggle with trichotillomania. Um, sometimes that can absolutely just be anxiety related, but also can shift over into that non-suicidal self-injury um, of pulling out hair. Um, and then again, another example could be headbanging or, or hitting themselves whether it's with their own hand, with their own body, or against the wall, um, or using inanimate objects, again, to, to hit or bang themselves. Um, so those can be pretty intense, and again, I think a lot of us sit with folks in our, in our offices who have certainly struggled with some pretty painful ways to try and get some relief. So for some of you, again, a little bit of a self-care warning. Um, those of you who haven't heard, and it used to be way bigger several years ago, but there are so many pro Anna websites, and I hear this the most from middle school and high school kids. Um, I've certainly heard this in college age, but wanted to bring up, um, I'll just scroll through a couple of these, on um, tips and tricks, and what a pro Anna website is, is it's a pro anorexia, or pro ways of self-harming or facilitating um, disordered eating in some way. So one example is, you know, um, Wear a rubber band around your wrist and snap it when you want to, when you feel hungry. Um, to of course try and not eat. Um, avoid reaching out to friends. Um, you know, only eat ice or at times eat ice or gum because those are quote good food substitutes. Um, again, the, so many of these are meant to kind of perpetuate people of staying in self harm in really unhealthy ways and people on these pro Anna websites can really celebrate people's unhealthy and unwell behavior. So when working with clients, especially with where technology is today, I think it's really important to ask clients. Um, it may take them some time to um, kind of peel back the layers of, of what they're looking at and what they're reading online. Um, but this is an important question that I think can get missed is when we ask our clients, um, when they are in some self-harm places or even some active disordered eating ways to self-harm is, you know, what kind of things are you looking at online? Um, and this is just one piece to have, have some awareness around. And there are multiple websites um, that are like this. So again, I think that's really important to check in with people about what they're looking at. So here is a slide that has lots of words. And I know sometimes for me, going to presentations or listening to presentations, um, I can be like, gosh, why are there so many words on one slide? 
So I am guilty of this um, in this moment. Um, but I also think there's a lot of good information on here. Um, and this is from a research program at Cornell. Um, and I've also added a few other little pieces myself um, over the past four or five years that I've incorporated into this model. Um, and this is kind of really looking at factors, predisposing factors and risk factors um, for people who struggle with non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so if we just look at the individual predisposition, predisposing factors, again, I want to say with all of that I'm sharing, this certainly isn't an everybody kind of thing. I really do look at clients um, as I certainly hope you do as well, and I'm sure many of you do, is we really treat the person. Um, we don't treat the box that we think a person fits into, is that we really treat the person. So if we're looking at individual, right, um, predisposing factors, possibility is their temperament. So individually, these are oftentimes people who are anxiety, have anxiety sensitivity. These are people who talk about feeling anxious about certainly big, tough stuff, but even the everyday ongoing thing. Um, negative mood intolerance. And so what I mean by that is these are people who have a really hard time looking at things that are on a positive kind of spin. These are people who tend to lean into what's going wrong or what could go wrong, um, what could be better versus what's going well right now. And these are people that need a lot of help kind of navigating back into that. Um, we've also got people with high emotional reactivity. So these are people who, what I call, and especially in the DBT world, um, I am not a DBT therapist, but we hear that um, distress window of tolerance, right? And so for some of these folks, their level of, dis of their level of tolerance can be pretty small around certain things. Again, the personality piece individually, there can be a lot of impulsivity. We certainly see this with adolescents, but what we know is with adolescents and their little prefrontal cortexes, um, all of that is still really developing. Um, they've got a long way to go. So some of them are navigating some impulsivity a little better than others. Um, obsessive compulsive traits. Does it mean these people are OCD or will have OCD? No, certainly not necessarily. But for some of these folks, they certainly hit some of those traits. And that's important to look at. Um, and then we've got some profession, perfectionistic folks. Um, and many of us have those folks that are coming into our facilities and our programs and offices um, who maybe don't struggle with self-harm at all, but who certainly are um, maybe looking for some recovery of perfectionism um, that they're needing some help with. But oftentimes these can be, again, individual um, factors that can contribute. So if we jump down to social predisposing factors, so social environment and what we know about environment for someone who struggles with self-harm and self-injury, um, the family environment. Um, often, again, not always, we're seeing environments that come from high control and lots of criticism. Um, and that can be certainly overt or covert. Um, and it also doesn't have to be from both, you know, parents. There could be, uh, it could be a single family household. Um, these could be people living in um, foster care systems, adoption, extended family. Again, but oftentimes we see this high control and high criticism energy that's happening. Uh, a low level of connectedness, again, in this family environment. And sometimes that means that the connectedness could mean maybe they're not receiving kind of parallel to emotional support. Um, and again, that could be a million different factors for a million different families. But if, you know, an adolescent or an adult is struggling with feeling connected to somebody within their family system or in their family environment or home environment, we really want to explore that. Um, because what we know is we, we are all hardwired for connection and belonging. Um, and we are all looking to get that in a variety of ways. And if we're unable to get that in some healthy ways, what we will do is start to look for it in certainly some unhealthy ways, as, as well as looking again for that emotional support. So we know these folks struggle with low emotional support as well. Traumatic experiences. Um, I do a big, huge part of my practice and my background is working with people with complex trauma. And so what we know is 
Again, not always, but there is a very, very, very high correlation in that upper 80s, um, high correlation with people who have non-suicidal self-injury um, also have a traumatic experience, if not multiple traumatic experiences within their lifetime. Um, so again, that could be emotional, physical, sexual abuse, peer bullying, witnessing a traumatic event, um, a medical, certainly a medical trauma. Um, we could, there's certainly a large list, um, as well as vicarious trauma. Um, <clears throat> when I think of vicarious trauma, um, or even secondary trauma, I can think of us, um, again, direct healthcare behavioral providers. I also think of our first responders and people in those fields. Um, and then if we look at this third piece around social factors, predisposing social factors, the cultural pressures. Gosh, and, and I don't know about you, but um, growing up, times of, times are different, and I think every generation can certainly say that. But the cultural pressure, certainly today, um, lots of unrealistic body stereotypes. This has just come through the years, and I think we hear about it maybe now more than ever due to media, due to technology, and just being inundated with information. Um, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis if we choose to stay plugged into that, um, and many people do. So again, cultural pressures of body stereotypes. Um, and again, I think around the self, self-injury behaviors, we tend to put a lot of that energy onto females, onto girls, onto young adult women. And what we know to be true is um, there has been an increased number of males, men, um, and even looking at transgender folks and non-binary folks, um, that this isn't just a single gender um, thing that's happening for, for a lot of our folks. So I think that's important. Um, Self-objectification, just what does that mean? What do I need to look like and talk like and sound like? And um, what fits where I live and who I go to school with? And there's a lot of energy around that. Um, and I think we, I know for those of you that maybe work with adolescents, young adults, um, it is constant in terms of body stereotypes and really how they look at themselves and how they view themselves. And that bumps up against with individual cultural pressures. Um, again, what's in our music, what's in our movies, what's in our magazines, what's on social media. Um, and, you know, that shifts over just to that one piece around social media. Um, I have met with an adolescent recently who is just beside herself because her mom has taken away some of her restrictions to Snapchat right now. Um, and she just will tell me she is struggling to function using her words without having Snapchat. And um, while some of us might chuckle and maybe internally roll our eyes, that is such a real thing um, for, for some of these adolescents and really learning how to support them and support their families um, around just the different messages that social media can, can pull up. Um, so if we look at specific risk factors, um, definitely there can be some emotional dysregulation um, for those of the, those folks who struggle with, again, that window of tolerance and trying to find a balance, cognitive distortion. Um, and those of you who are familiar with attachment model and attachment style, which is the type of work I kind of pull from, um, it could really be anybody coming from an avoidant style ambivalent, anxious, ambivalent, or disorganized. Um, what we know is there is a high correlation of people in disorganized attachment. Um, a lot of those folks who have disorganized attachment adaptations um, do often have a diagnosis um, of some type of personality piece, um, especially with borderline personality disorder. Again, we talked about low body regard, struggling with that. Um, dissociation. Um, these are people, again, um, who can often talk about kind of, quote, going away in their head, drifting away, going away, losing track of time, or actually not even having an awareness of something that's happened. Um, I've worked with some folks who tend to do some pretty pervasive self-harm when they are not present um, and when they are dissociating. Um, and while dissociation can feel relieving for a lot of folks, um, it helps them kind of, it's the ultimate checkout. Um, again, what the danger is there and what can be harmful is, is they may go and do or say things and have behaviors and have no memory 
and really cause harm to themselves. Um, again, another specific risk factor is around peer influence. You know, um, how many times have we talked to, again, if it's someone who's a teenager or young adult or an older adult, um, oftentimes we'll hear, well, how did, how did you even hear about, you know, kind of cutting or burning or self-harm? Um, and lots of times we will hear people say, well, I had a friend or my sister's friend, um, or especially now, you know, I, learned, I heard about it online or heard about it in a movie. Um, but it also depends on how, how we're hearing about it and what that energy is going towards that. Um, so peer influence. I always want to ask people, where did this come from for you? How did you find out about this? Um, and then again, we could certainly touch on psychiatric disorders and, and the ones that tend to align with self-harm. So again, a lot of language, but I think this can be really helpful. Um, I will use some of these pieces even with family members who are trying to kind of understand. Um, I'll break it out a little differently just around self -ed around education, that psychoeducation for family systems. So I know there may be some questions from that slide because that was a lot of information. So um, I know your sponges might be getting a little full. Um, so why self-harm? Um, for some, it's, a, it's creating an experience of feeling something. You know, for those of you, I don't know if any of you have seen kind of the older movie um, with Sandra Bullock called 28 Days. Um, I think it's a great movie. I think there are some things that are definitely spot on in terms of going to residential treatment for addiction, mental health. And then I certainly think there are other parts of the movie that are certainly for drama in movies. But there's a character in the movie that is Sandra Bullock's roommate. And she struggles with cutting. And I remember there's a part in the movie, and Sandra Bullock asked this girl, who's 17, um, you know, why do you do that? Why do you cut? And the girl says, in this kind of sad, solemn way, she said, because it feels better. And Sandra Bullock said, feels better than what? And the girl gently says, it feels better than everything else. And so, there's so many ways we can fill in all of those pieces. Um, and for some, they'll just say, it feels like something, because some of our folks are walking around and struggling to access their feeling center, um, because it hasn't felt safe to feel, or they're not quite sure how to access some of that. So self-harm helps them tap into that. Again, if we look at the neurobiology piece around neurotransmitter pleasure center, there's a release, right? There's a burst of dopamine that can happen. Um, or there's a release. And for some people who certainly have no appetite or thoughts around why would someone cut themselves, how in the wor world can that feel pleasurable? We know to be true that for some people there is a biological experience that happens, again, in the brain. And there is some dopamine and filtered in with some GABA. Again, that gets this burst of something that says, Oh, I can I can breathe a little. There's a release of something, which is where that pleasure center and reward comes in, which is why for so many, they don't just cut once or they don't just self-harm once. Um, it can be more perpetuating. For some, they talk about self-harm as a form of punishment. I deserve this, right? Um, I deserve this. I des it's sometimes um, when I hear people say, I deserve this, um, when we think about cutting, for example, there can be some <clears throat> words. This is where some words can get written into the body um, as a form of hurt and injury and, again, of punishment. Um, a woman I referenced earlier who I know drinks, has drank shampoo in the shower before. For her, um, it really is about a form of punishment. Um, she feels a lot all the time, so it's not about needing to feel something. For her, it's around, it's around that piece. And so we work at where that punishment comes from um, and, and how, to get, how to get some freedom around that. Um, for some people, people talk about self-soothing. It just feel, it, it's self-soothing. It feels better. Um, it's a release. Again, I think there's that pleasure center piece that happens in the brain. Um, so you'll hear some of your clients say, it just, it makes me feel better. And get to know, I, again, I say, Stay curious about that with clients. Get get to know what what does that mean? What does that mean that it feels better? Um, see if they can tell you. Um, sometimes our clients who are struggling with this, sometimes they may struggle with with language, um, especially depending on where they are if they are healing from some trauma resolution. So this is where art can be helpful. 
This is where experiential pieces can be helpful because sometimes that language is hard to get out there. Um, so maybe have them draw. How does it feel better? How does it feel better? And then again, a, a last piece might be out of emotional regulation is maybe the days, maybe they've been so anxious, for example. That's one example. They've been so anxious. They feel like they're coming out of their skin. Um, they just are having a really hard time regulating, getting themselves to calm down, come down, um, be able to breathe, be able to think on a linear way. And so they will say, if I can cut, that slows everything down. And they have this feeling that really comes over them as a sense of control. I can do something about this. Um, and, and certainly that's what comes from that. Um, and so it is a sense of control. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy sense of control, but it is a sense of control. Um, another piece that I didn't have on here is for a lot of folks, they will cut to help with anxiety or to help with a sense of control because for some of these people, um, it keeps them from killing themselves. Again, while self-harm isn't an attempt of suicide, um, for some of our clients, we will hear them say, if, if I didn't have self-harm, I, I don't know what I would do. And again, that's where I, I'm really glad that they're, they're in our facilities or in our offices. Um, so I put up a quote that um, I heard a, a tattoo artist say one time when I was talking to them about um, just people coming in and getting tattoos. And we've certainly heard about some people might be addicted to tattoos. But this tattoo artist said, I dig the experience in terms of tattooing people. When someone is going through something, some emotional pain, sometimes they like the physical pain of something like a tattoo. Emotional pain, again, this is what he's saying, emotional pain has no location, and physical pain does. You can name it so it does, it, so it does become a little more manageable. And I thought that was really powerful and interesting. Um, when he's talking about tattoos, because obviously a tattoo is certainly being localized, being placed on a certain part of the body. There's a focus there. And for some of our folks, and I, I've known some folks who do get tattoos, um, for some of these folks who struggle with either active self-harm or are in recovery from self-harm, these are some folks that sometimes will actually fall asleep while getting a tattoo or just get really relaxed and get in a zone. Um, around it. So I certainly always talk to folks about what was that like. Um, and again, there are some of us that just feel like you're coming out of your skin the whole time you're getting a tattoo. So I thought this was really a beautiful way of um, even a tattoo artist being able to name, uh, name some of this kind of physical and localized pain. So I'm just going to touch on this. And when the other Christy <laughs> introduced me, she talked about the polyvagal model um, and the polyvagal theory. And that's we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks doing training about the polyvagal theory. But basically what that happens is for a lot of our folks who struggle with non-suicidal self-injury and self-harm um, is when they are in the moments before self-injury. Um, for some of these folks, they're having what's called a dorsal collapse. Um, some of these folks, there's something called low dorsal and then there's dorsal collapse. We're talking about a dorsal collapse here, which is, their, their uh, digestive system, their swallowing system, their social engagement system, which is how they connect and reach out to others in healthy ways, um, all of that kind of just shuts down. Um, this is maybe where they're getting pain in their tummies or in their stomach. Um, their breathing might be a little more shallow. Um, they're just not very connected. Um, to a whole lot, and they are just doing what they need to survive, um, and that's what we call a dorsal collapse or a survival collapse. Um, and so, for some of our clients to get out of that, is they end up self-harming um, because it brings them back into the moment, back into their body, um, back into a pleasure-seeking experience if that neurotransmitter gets lit up, um, and so it helps them activate mildly their ventral vagal response which is what we call our social engagement system. It brings them back um, to connecting to themselves in some way. Again, not to say that it's in the most healthiest of ways, but that gives us massive amounts of information. Um, what we're really wanting and hoping for clients to do is to have a more active and healthy social engagement system. 
that helps them to attach and connect with some safe and secure relationships. Um, and when they're in the midst of that self-harm or just before self-harm, that feels like that's impossible to, to go and obtain. Even if someone's just downstairs that's willing to sit with you, um, that can feel really difficult to engage with. Um, the other piece is when I talk to people in my office um, about getting in touch with their body. So what we know about certainly about trauma and about self-harm when people are struggling with that is some people are very connected to their body and they hate that uh, um, and are certainly wanting to work on that for some. Um, and then some people are very disconnected either to their whole body or segments and parts of their body. Um, and so oftentimes I will gently, depending on where a client is that day, um, is invite them to get connected, reconnected to the goal, ultimate goal of their whole body, but certainly in sections. And the reason I put it takes eight times longer. So if we take just a minute and I'll say, I want you to take a deep breath, a couple of deep breaths, and I want to invite you to think about how your stomach feels, how your throat feels, start with your throat, how your throat feels, how your chest feels as it moves down, and how your stomach feels. So take just a minute to notice that, and then answer that to yourself. And continue to breathe. So for the sake of time, some of you may need more time to actually figure that out or to notice that even more. Some of you are able to get to that in a, in a fairly short amount of time. But what we know is when we ask someone what they're thinking or even emotionally feeling, they can tell us on a fairly quick response. But when we invite someone to go inside and to talk about how what's happening in their body, we, we scientifically know that it takes a person eight times longer to tell us how they're feeling in their body than it does to just talk about a thought or a feeling. And so that's, that's a time where it, it's really important um, to help a client and maybe even you as a practitioner to slow down. Um, sometimes clients will get frustrated that they can't answer that more quickly. Like, I don't know how my stomach feels. Like, they just maybe quickly say that. And then I invite somebody to say, well, that's okay. Let's take a minute. Let's just take a minute. And we're not in a hurry. Um, and some people want to figure that out and some people really don't. Um, but again, I encourage people and let people know it takes everybody eight times longer to get connected with their body. Um, and that's just kind of across the board. So that's a really important piece to, to share with clients. Um, again, about having that connection and reparative experience. So healing below the surface. So let's talk about how do we how do we help people continue to navigate this process? And to quote, get some some people use the language of get some recovery around self-harm. Um, and for some people, re quote, recovery and this vulnerability and awareness and connection of healing with self-harm, for some people, it's very abstinence-based. Like, I'm in recovery from self-harm. If I haven't done any self-harm in X amount of days, weeks, months, even hours. Um, for some people, that can look and sound really different. If someone's been self-harming every single day for a while, let's say months, um, to maybe have some some health and, and wellness around that, maybe that means they only did it three times that week. That that's a win, right? That that is healing. So again, it, that's that important piece of really kind of looking at our clients and saying, um, what what is health and wellness for you? And let's talk about goals for you. And again, for some people, their long term goal may not be to never self harm. Um, that actually might sound pretty awful to, to some folks. So again, helping them navigate what does healing for them mean. Um, and what we know is, is that it's not always just about the self-injurious behavior. It's certainly what's below the surface. And those of you who work with addiction, um, we, we absolutely know that. We know that there certainly is a 
um, brain factor, a physical dependency factor, right, that our brain and body actually can get addicted to something. Um, but what we know is um, in terms of behaviorally and emotionally and mental health-wise, um, gosh, it's so not about the alcohol or it's so not about the drugs or about the food if we're talking about process addiction or shopping. Um, it's really getting below what's underneath there. So if we talk about um, common emotions um, related, um, again, re related to non-suicidal um, self-injury is we need to allow clients to discharge anger. Um, and when I say the word discharge anger, it means to allow some emotions to come out. Um, actually, hang on just a second. Let me, there we go. All right. So we need to allow some clients to discharge anger, which is allowing them a healthy release of emotion from their body. Um, now, does that mean that everybody who struggles with self-injury is angry? Well, no. Um, do they struggle with anger at times? Certainly. I think a lot of us can. We also know that feeling angry and feeling mad is a really healthy emotion, as are all emotions. Um, so we need to help them find ways that feel healthy and safe for them. And certainly we know if there aren't healthy and safe ways, then we'll come up with ways on our own, um, healthy or not. So again, it's exploring with that client um, ways of getting relief or certainly noticing patterns. I think that's really important is doing kind of this analysis of what tend to be patterns with self-harm. Um, Again, we do that in other behavioral things, whether it's addiction or um, or even process things. Um, but what are some of those patterns? So again, helping people find that. For many of our clients, when they do talk about common emotions, such as anger, for example, anger for a lot of our clients feels better, quote, better, than feeling sad or feeling scared. What we know is what's really underneath a lot of anger for a lot of people is there is some deep-rooted fear around some things. But that energy tends to come up as anger because, in fact, um, when we feel angry for some people, they experience strength and energy. And that certainly does feel better for some people over sadness or fear. I think we typically, when we think about gender roles or gender, you know, kind of overall, is we tend to think of um, we've given masculine energy that rap or we've talked about men. Um, they're the ones that tend to get angry the most and they just go to either being okay or being angry and and what we know is is that <laughs> that it's just not true that there are a lot of men walking around pretty angry and I can also tell you there are a lot of women walking around feeling pretty angry um, and for some people again that feels better because there's a sense of strength and energy versus feeling sad um, that certainly brings about a lower level of energy and some people will say I can't help this and, and certainly that's true. Certainly that's why a lot of them are coming here. Um, some people don't know who they are if they're not angry. Um, they've, they've had to operate that way for so long. That's been a part of their physiology for a really long time. Um, and sadness certainly for some people slows them down, um, literally. Um, and there's a heaviness and a weightedness to it. And so for some people to think about getting out of that anger and tapping into maybe some fear or sadness, um, that's a really challenging place, and vice versa, and vice versa. So again, I think it's um, important to help folks be able to navigate. Tell me, tell me how these fears, tell me how these fears and anger and sadness, how do they help you? Um, what's the payoff to stay in angry all the time? And again, that's where some people will talk about strength and energy, or for people, sadness. What's the payoff from kind of staying in this sadness and and having this non-suicidal pieces? Um, and again, we've talked about how non-suicidal self-injury um, can can help people get out of the numbness. Sometimes they'll tell you, I am burning, I am pulling, I am picking, because it helps me feel something. Um, when they will talk about not feeling anything, I just feel numb all the time. I feel like I don't feel anything. Um, so some of them will say, I feel like it kind of brings me back to life for a little while. Um, so again, we want to kind of navigate those emotions of, how can we help access some of that? How can we explore that um, so that you're not walking around feeling feeling numb all the time? Again, it, that's been completely out of self-preservation for someone who talks about feeling numb. So I know as a clinician, I'm not looking to just rip away their numbness. 
um, is I want to say, gosh, that's probably really served you. It's helped you get to where you are. Um, but it also sounds like it, it might not be working for you as much anymore. Um, so, so let's talk about how to, how to take care of you in a really gentle way while still supporting you feeling numb sometimes. Um, again, we, we want people to keep functioning um, and maybe titrating what they need in a really gentle way. So therapeutic corrective experiences. Um, if we had more time, we could talk about more stuff. Um, but this is just a few little brief pieces. So I want to talk about for a moment of autoregulation and co-regulation. So in a really, really simplistic, brief way, autoregulation means that I can, I'm going to use myself as an example, that autoregulation means I can be out in the world, whether that's grocery shopping, um, going to hear something music related, being at home by myself, maybe it's with a pet, maybe it's just with me, but that I can really be by myself and be able to regulate and navigate my emotions and I am not in distress, okay? And that's the key. I'm not in distress. It, it feels great. It feels pleasant. It feels neutral, um, but I'm not in distress. Um, and then we have co-regulation. Again, and that's with when we're with another person. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean any person. Um, for some people it can be, but for the most part, this is somewhere, someone where we can, whether it's one person, whether it's multiple people, where we can sit, we can have dialogue, whether it's small talk, whether it's meaningful conversation, whether it's a meeting one-on-one -on -one or in a group meeting. Um, Whatever that is, is that we can have a back and forth dialogue that either feels informational, supportive, emotional, um, whatever that is, and be with somebody else, and that is not distressing, that that feels helpful. And the same with autoregulation, not distressful and can feel helpful. We all have certainly met people who sometimes can, we hear people say being addicted to autoregulation, they want to be by themselves all the time. And that the thought of co-regulation on a more regular basis, that does not sound like a good idea. Um, and vice versa, we've certainly met people who struggle to really be by themselves, doing anything. Um, and so, again, helping these people find a balance. And some of our folks that struggle with non-suicidal self-injury struggle to have a balance. Does that mean that some people are going to feel better auto-regulating more than co-regulating? Absolutely. Um, just that's within the definition of introvert and extrovert. It's how we get our energy. Um, and again, some of our extroverts um, at times can certainly appreciate being by themselves and having some downtime. Um, but again, this is helping people with self-injury find a balance. Um, and for some of our folks, they are getting maybe the first safe and secure co-regulation with us in our office or in our program or in our facility, maybe than they ever have before. Um, and that is just vital to help support someone's, really someone's nervous system and what's happening. Um, kind Eyes is a guided imagery exercise that I do um, and that I've pulled from Diane Poole Heller, who's just an incredible attachment therapist, somatic attachment therapist out west. And for some people to help invite in co-regulation, to feel supported maybe when they are actually alone, um, is I had them do imagery um, around thinking up a person or an animal or an entity or um, anything that, that if you closed your eyes, open or closed, you imagine that presence and that person or animal is looking back at you. And this is someone that feels safe and comforting and supportive and kind and is, is glad to be with you and is glad to see you. Um, so again, that can, I can certainly draw that out into more of a corrective experience. And then I want to just name a few grounding techniques. So we certainly have heard the word grounding um, for some of our people uh, who are struggling with non-suicidal self-injury, especially if they've been in multiple therapies or treatments. Some of them will tell you, I'm so sick of talking about grounding. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Um, but nonetheless, we're needing to bring them back to the here and now. So 
um, some techniques that I've used with folks. Sometimes it's here in my office and sometimes it's when they're home. Is holding ice. For some people, they'll say that's silly, um, that's not helpful, but it can be temporarily helpful. So I'll encourage a client to get either one piece of ice or a piece of ice for each hand. Um, some people will hold ice. I literally encourage people to hold ice until both pieces have melted um, in their hands. Some people choose to hold a piece of ice on the place, on their body, maybe where they wanted to self-injure. Um, and so literally kind of feeling that so cold it burns kind of feeling, and it's a very much a mindfulness piece because you're just thinking about um, that cold ice. Um, and there's been some research out several years ago around after kind of holding an ice, holding the ice and taking some time to go back and forth, our olfactory sense of smell, um, holding ice and then literally smelling like a lemon or a lime. Um, again, there's some really incredible research around the olfactory piece and some other pieces in the brain that get lit up with that citrus piece that helps to kind of regenerate a healing reparative experience. Um, so that's what that's there. Pressure on places on the body. Um, that's a somatic experiencing technique. So in my office, I actually have weighted pillows um, that I actually made. If you're interested, you can certainly email me. I can tell you about that. But I have where people can either put some weight on with a pillow, either on their lap, on their feet, um, holding those, and that can be something they can do at home as well. Um, I actually have a client, and when she needs some co-regulation, um, but she doesn't feel connected to a pillow, she'll ask me to sit next to her on the couch, and then she likes, I'll just sit still, and she likes the experience of leaning into me with her shoulder and my shoulder, and she just kind of has a gentle pressure that just feels helpful to kind of re-regulate her nervous system. Um, some people write on themselves with markers, whether it's words or things that they would want to to maybe put in their body. Writing, again, guided imagery. Um, meditation. Um, I have some clients um, that where they can, you know, will kind of have this contract that when they're feeling like self-harming um, is they'll pull up meditations that we've kind of agreed upon prior to um, and they can access several different medica meditations and their agreement is, is they'll listen to at least a five-minute meditation prior to self-harming. Um, and at the end of that five minutes, if they still want to self-harm, well, they've leaned into that. Um, or they've, some of that energy has shifted. Um, so that's a technique. Peppermint or spearmint, um, the reason I say that is because I have peppermint in my office. And a lot of clients get really connected to having, again, I'm big on senses. Because that pulls them back into the here and now, especially if clients are having some dissociative features. Um, and things are coming up. So I'm a peppermint person. I know some people are spearmint people. I um, actually have spearmint too, but most of my clients really like peppermint. Um, so that, again, can be a grounding piece. Um, and whether they're here in my office, I have some clients that have purposely bought peppermints at home um, because that feels better for them and that reminds them of being here. And then, again, essential oils if we're thinking about that olfactory piece. The last piece I want to touch on real quick um, when, when working with this population of people who struggle with um, non-suicidal self-injury is oftentimes these people will harm themselves in a way that they, they probably do need medical care. Um, some of them try and do that as best they can, um, but for the most part, they really do need some extra care. So what I like to talk with clients about prior to them being injured in any way is if they need medical care, what can happen? Um, for some of these folks, they have had some really awful medical experiences where they go to get medical care, whether it's at urgent care or an emergency room to treat a cut or a burn or another type of broken bone that they've caused. Um, and medical staff, not always, but oftentimes will quickly just, you know, kind of put some pieces together and say, this is someone who is, you know, highly suicidal. And for a lot of our folks, it's just not the case. So I've got um, some clients who have um, some primary care doctors and nursing staff who I can actually talk to and have some support around these clients going and getting medical treatment by providers that get this and that are open to um, partnering with me and hopefully partnering with you and talking about um, these people actually reaching out and getting some support 
Um, it's certainly not something we want to just have as a revolving door all the time that reinforces self-harm. Um, but again, if, if these folks can really reach out and get some support, that's incredible. So that's another part of my practice. So I want to take a minute and kind of wrap up this time and allow a few moments for questions. And I just want to say thank you for your time. And, and I'm so glad you, you logged in and, and chose to chose to join join together today. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you do where you are. Oh, thank you so much, Christy. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll give you a minute to type it in. I do have one sitting here in the queue. Um, it comes from okay. Linda. And she says um, she is working with a six-year-old who is NSSI. Any experience with that young and any suggestions? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I typically don't work with as young as six. Um, I certainly have um, a 10-year-old, actually. Um, six is tough. Um, I would, some of the things we even talked about um, is I would be really curious. My first question is um, really curious how they learned about it, um, how, how they know to do what they're doing, what it feels like. I would just get really um, curious. I use the word curious a lot, and I, I would use that with kids. I use that word with kids and adults. Um, as I'm really curious about what that's like for you um, and um, what do they get? What's, what do they get when they do self-harm? And what I mean by that is um, how does it make them feel if they're able to talk about it? And what is the role of their caregivers? So whether that's a parent, an aunt, a grandmother, whomever are their caregivers um, or mom and dad, moms and moms and whoever that is, is what does how do those caregivers show up for this child when this child has harmed themselves thank you for that um i haven't seen any more questions but while i'm rolling through this last little bit um maybe somebody has one um i just wanted to remind everybody that we do record our webinars and i would be happy to provide an audio recording if you're interested in the slide deck you can reach out to christy herself she um just uh, had her her email up there. Um, it is clcp1114 at gmail.com. If you happen to miss that, go ahead and email me at cweeks at, Estes, uh, at Harmony Place, uh, sorry, um, at harmonyfoundationinc.com. Um, we have lost our presenter. She um, got uh, dropped. The call got dropped. But if you're interested in the next webinar, uh, it's on April 24th with Denise Bellinger talking about barriers, barriers for women seeking treatment. So look out for that email. Um, it'll be going out next week. When you receive the survey today, please, please, please be sure to include your suggestions um, or any topic ideas that you think might be of interest. We'd love to hear them. Um, we've got Christy's slide back. Welcome back, Christy. Um, her office location, phone number, and email are all right there. If you have any one-off questions for her, um, she'll be happy to answer them. Again, thank you so much, um, Christy, for your informative webinar. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to share it with us. And on behalf of Harmony Foundation, thank you to everyone who participated in our webinar. Um, we hope to see you again next month. Thanks.